You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Ronitz and I'm joined by a full screen of guests this afternoon. I've got Pat Rowe, uh, John Townley and Ashley Priest. But it's a bit of a, a mid-season winter break or, or whatever we've, we've called it. Um, it's a couple of weeks till Villa play their next game and it's Leeds United on the 9th of February, I think it is. So I felt like that was a good time to kind of take stock of where we were, have a bit of a break ourselves and discuss the season so far. So we're going to like assess... Assess where Aston Villa are basically. I think Smith had eleven games, Gerard have had has had ten, so pretty much even even pegging. So I've got 10, 10, 11 questions. I'm gonna get an answer off each of you. We've got the comments watching along as well on Facebook. So you know, feel free to get involved in the discussion as always. Um but before we get into that, how are we all? Ash, do you wanna let us know how you are? Nice to have a full squad. Full squad here to <laughs> choose from. So uh, yeah, buzzy mate, I'm all good. Yeah, very well. Another busy week, but yeah, it's been good. Mm. And John, been a couple of episodes since you last on the podcast with me anyway. How, how are you? Yeah, it's been like a month now. No, I'm good, I'm good. No Villa for like two weeks now, so that's a bit of a shame. But, yeah, I'm mm, good. Boring, isn't it? To be honest, I know we've got the transfer window, but I want to, I want to see Villa play games. Um, so first question then, I'm going to come to you all for an answer for every single question so you can keep it as brief or as long as you like. Uh, we'll start with you, Ash, on this one. I just want you to sum up your feelings towards the Dean Smith era versus the Stephen Gerrard era. Villa taking it to a new level now. Um Dean Smith did what he did and did, did, a, did a pretty good job as well. Um, kicked Villa on another gear, Dean did. And uh, looking back, I think he left at the right time. Thing, I think things turned a bit against him. Whether that's the player or, or whatnot. Just just that momentum went, didn't it, in the early season. And um, in terms of Gerard coming in back in November now, bit of a member of the day, Sunday afternoon, whirlwind, whirlwind of the day. Yeah. Just finished Southampton on the Saturday or Friday night, Friday night football might have been. And um, yeah, it happened so quickly. And Gerald was in the door in the matter of a couple of days. Um, like I said, a bit of a whirlwind. But transitioning into this new era now, I think it's very exciting. We've seen the January transfer window, the, the Paul Gerald attracts that the type of player he wants. Some interesting comments from Perslo two weeks ago now saying Gerald wants to up the age profile. He wants to prove the winners in the building. Whereas before, I think under Smith, I think, I think he relied a lot on the, the scouting network, Johan Langer. Previously, um, Jesus Garcia Pitar taking a bit of a risk in the, in the market previously. Whereas now, I think Villa are going at it full ammo. In it with Juventus, man, he's his number one target. Rodrigo Bentacor as well. Champions League players. Um, I noted yeah. down the, the other day, I think um, 90 Champions League appearances, Coutinho, Dino, and Olsen have got. So they're getting, get, they're getting players with pedigree in the building. So that's going to be the mantra moving forward. And as we know, European qualification is the aim. So, yeah, I just think Gerard takes Villa to a new level now. Um, and I think I think with the Martinez contract being the way it is, 2027, I think McGinn's going to get tied down soon as well. I think they're building for a bigger and better Villa. And hopefully we'll be uh, them European notes a return to B6, yeah? We're at risk here of all repeating pretty much the same answer every time but with these questions. So, you know, if, if you feel like Ash has already said what you wanted to say, just shout up. But Pat, how do you feel about, about the two eras at Aston Villa so far? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was the, to let go of the Dean Smith era was a bit tough, wasn't it, towards the end? But like I said, like Ash said, it's, he got to the stage where he, you felt that he'd taken the club as far as he can, really. And Gerard has seemingly stepped things up with the transfer window and the uh, intensity and like, a little off the field things like no ketchup and all that. I feel like it's all just stepped up a gear, bringing players in that we don't necessarily need them in the position. So like Ben Tancor for Louise or whatever box to box or play the number six, Coutinho an attacking option, and then then even like little moves like bringing back Kane Kessler uh, Hayden and then Cash has one of his better games. Just little things like that. I feel like Gerard's just tapping into like the competitive edge that he has over people. Mm. Just like elevating the club that way, so yeah. Just ex- in terms of the Gerard era, it's just a really exciting time to be a fan, isn't it? And exciting time to cover it. Yeah, much the same from the same as the guys. I think to be honest, I think it's more his demeanour and the way he carries himself, the way he's come into the club, and all of a sudden it feels like he's been here for five years. Same as his backroom team as well. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it clouds my sort of vision from the start in terms of we got two wins straight away, but I'm not too. Ex- um, to I don't know how to say it. Like I'm, I, I was expecting it to kind of go like this. If you know that makes sense. I think the, this is in the squad that we got the kind of the foundations that Gerard's already got, and all the investment that the um, owners have backed him with as well. I don't think he could kind of go up uh, any any sort of different. Um, that that's not. I'm not trying to not give any credit to Gerard necessarily, but I think it's all. It's almost like a perfect storm for it to go 
to go well. I don't know. I, you know, I think the first couple of weeks were sort of he made all the intentions clear that this is what he wanted to do. Um, and since then, it's only been you know packed of packed full of good things. And he's saying the transfer market is he's laid down exactly what he wants, and the owners have backed him. Um, clearly, he's got uh, you know the message across the players as well. Um, so yeah, so far so good. I think he said when he walked in the building at Ibrox, he said the first couple of weeks were the most important just to lay down all of his ideas and get this sort of respect mm. players. And that seems to be exactly what he's done at Villa as well. So no, I think um, Gerard is, you know, I don't think it could go much better for him. Nothing's ever given him football necessarily. Um, he'll be saying that to his players when, you know, let's continue uh, where we've started. You've pretty much answered my second question there as well, so I'll come back to you last for the next one. Uh, just looking at um, the Premier League record for the two managers, Smith played 11, won three, drawn one, lost seven. Gerard played 10, won five, drawn one, lost four. It's very much win or lose, isn't it? We've had only two draws all season in the league, as long as I've done my research correct. Um, and those losses for Gerard, Man City, Chelsea and Liverpool, which are to be expected. It's only the Brentford one, really, that, that, that's the disappointment out of those. So second question, has Gerard done a better job than you maybe maybe would have anticipated before he came in? Start with you this time, Pat. Um, I feel like there was always a bit of scepticism about whether he'd make the step up to the Premier League and whatnot. I feel like I already had high, uh, high hopes for it. Uh, looking at the uh, system he liked to play over that 4-3-3 three, three and the narrow forwards, I always thought, I could see why they went for Gerard. I thought it was a nice fit for Watkins and Buendia and, and everything. And yeah, I feel like he has been done better than expected in the short time he's, he's had, to be honest. like Even the wins you mentioned, like going ahead against Chelsea, I know we fell off in that second half. But the Liverpool performance, I thought, was really good and done by a penalty decision. It was probably a bit dubious. And then we could have got a draw there. And then the City performance, I know we started slow there, but the second half there was really good. The Brentford was probably the only... Only like slipping back into bad habits for Villa that coming out and not yeah. competing or anything. But um, yeah, in terms, I'm, I'm pretty impressed by it. The uh, United game was a good showing, showing a bit of fight there. And I, I said on the podcast the, at the start of the year that I wanted to see Villa start grinding out results and transferring these good performances and losses into some good performances and maybe grind out a draw. And we're starting to do that. So yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, better. Yeah, you're looking. I think his last league game in charge of Rangers against Ross County. It was a 4 1 win. And within days, he's got to face up against an informed Brighton side who caused Villa problems in the past. The new group. I mean, such a mad turnaround um, for Gerald to come in from Glasgow and then meet the squad and then pick a team. He, he was thrust into it. So, yeah, I think he's been better than expected, to be honest with you. Um, I think he's, he's proven his stripes already for me. You look at the performances against. The Lost Cities and Liverpool, they really held their own. Um, I was getting a point at Man U as well, playing really well there. So, mm. played a few of the big dogs as well. And now, I think now we'll see, see Gerard. He's got two weeks with them now. Mini pre season, he's called it. He's going to real get, get stuck into them. And I think there's a, there's a kind run of uh, fixtures now for, for, for Villa to get some points on the board. So, I think the bedding, the bedding in period's over now. I think it's um, full on the task at hand. and there's winnable games coming, so I think we'll learn a lot more about Gerard Villa in the coming weeks. But yeah, I mean, coming into the job, I think the massive um, getting off to a fly against Brighton was massive. They weren't great in that game, but they come on late, got the win, clean sheet, rolled into the next one. I think Palace wasn't it away, hard place to go. That is, Villa get a win there as well. So yeah, I think he's done better than expected for me. You look at his record at Rangers, won the title. Yeah, like I say, he's an obvious one up there. It's a two-horse race up there, but I think his record in Europe was pretty good as well. He really pushed the logs to Leon and I think all the Benfica he played as well. And it's a real, real fine already beat as well. So he got every bit of um, what he could have at the Rangers squad. And I think coming into now, I think he's he's made this Villa job his own now. So, yeah, top marks for me, mate. Just quickly, how do you rate Gerard's time at Villa so far out of 10? I'd probably give it 7.5, pushing on to an 8. I think that, that Brentford game is the only one holding us back, isn't it? We got a win there. I don't know if it had taken us up the table or whatnot, but it just felt like the second half did not happen. Cheap goals can see just before half time completely killed us, didn't it? But other than that, competing with the big dogs, had some tough fixtures, a few good wins when he first came in, and then they didn't really have much time to work with the team. And now he's got, like Ash said, he's got this mini pre season. I feel like the style of play, I think when, when he first got appointed, Josh Williams mentioned that you're not probably got, you're not going to see the style of play going forward that Gerald wants until he's had a pre-season. So with the current fixtures after this short like break, then maybe we'll start seeing it like a bit more of the uh, Norwich performance where we're dominating teams a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I'd probably give him an eight as well. I think that Brentford performance probably just takes it down for a nine for me. Um, 
And then, of course, we've had say tricky games: Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea, um, Leicester as well. But obviously, we beat them. Uh, so I'd give it an eight. But again, with context of the fixtures, fixtures that we've played, um, you know, you'd probably be going towards a nine, even a ten, if we had some more favourable games, as you know, the ones we have got coming up. Uh, but no, really good start. I'd give it eight out of ten. Yeah, I've got nine. Gerard's got me really hard. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I've been so, so impressed with him. I just think of the, the transformation. You go back to that Southampton game, I think seven of the 11 played that night to the Everton one on, on, on the weekend. Seven seven players still played. Same players, same blokes. Yeah. And just what he's getting out of them now, totally different, chalk and cheese. I know my momentum was against Villa that, that night, Southampton, obviously on a losing streak, but he's rallied the troops, really has. And Villa was a tough look to crack now. Um so for me, nine out of ten from Gerard. What more do you want? That Brentford game was was a blip. He wasn't in the dugout for Chelsea. I thought Villa were poor against Chelsea as well. He we weren't in the dugout. I think Villa missed that. And yeah, going out in the cup against Manu, that was that was a sore one to take as well. Give him mm. one of Villa could deep in that. So yeah, Brentford was a, was a blip. But I'm, I'm going nine out of ten. I think I think I'm really excited by what, but by the. Well, the future with me, Jared at the helm, yeah. I'm going to sit on the fence between all three of you and say 8.5 and go back to answering, yeah, yeah. asking the questions. And um, we'll do an episode on the transfer window as a whole when it closes and kind of assess the transfer window. But Coutinho and Dina through the door, Olsen as well. It's a pretty good transfer window, isn't it, so far? I'm going to come back to you, Ash, because Pat and John are both on mute for some reason. So there must be some noise at there. And so, Ash, we'll carry on. One more can you ask for a couple of weeks in? Um, he's already got the Coutinho, Dean, and obviously Robin Olsen in. I think there's 160 international caps there between them. So, 90 Champions League appearances between them. So, real, real players with pedigree, like we mentioned. Um, I think, like I said, we're entering a new phase now, attracting top-level players, Benton Cores being one of them. Um, so, the, there's going to be a real shift in terms of transfer mantra now for me. I think it points to a massive summer. I really do. I think you could find a couple of the, the first-teamers probably, probably heading out, you know. A lot of talk about Douglas Louise of late. Gerard wasn't too complimentary of him when I asked about him last week. He said, he's done okay for us. So, Ready to that, what you like. Personally, I, I like Douglas. I think there's more to come from him. He's only 23. But like you say, the, the level of player Villa want to attract with Gerard at the helm now, you, you've got a question. Some might be moving on. Um, yeah. Villa, are not, Villa are moving on to a different level. So transfer window on the whole, I think, yeah, been really good so far. I'm intrigued about the Coutinho one. I don't know if people making the comments. He, he was short at the weekend. Couldn't mean a couple of lads in the press box kept looking at each other when he kept giving the ball away. I was like, oh, um, bit, bit, bit short fitness-wise, but He's back in Brazil. Hopefully that gives him a bit of a boost. Hopefully he gets some game time, gets some minutes into his legs. He's a great A player there, as we know. So I'm intrigued to see how that pans out. Luca Dean, I think the lads will agree here. <laughs> real, real top quality signing left back. Mm. He's already shown what he can do. I logged his, his carriage at the weekend, playing against his former club and putting the star showing. So and Robin Olsen, just, just to fill the gap. Um, I don't like the free trials of Jed Steele at the moment, but we'll see. But Olsen's come in. Bit more quality in the goalkeeping department, but yeah, so far so good, and hopefully one or two left to do. And I think it's all pointed towards Bentico, isn't it? Five days left, get him in. What do we know it's been? You know, the main point is that in January, whenever, when do you ever get to sort of increase? Um, sorry, improve your team as much as we are. I think last year when we when we bought Sanson, I thought that was the, the sort of not necessarily the pinnacle, but we haven't signed someone as good as Sanson over the last few years. Sorry, mm. I'm um, uh, you know, since since we got promoted list. Um, so then coming on to the level that we have now, bringing in Coutinho, Digne or Dean, um, those two players that don't only just get in your team but couldn't take it to a next level as well. Okay. To do that in January, you know, it sets you, sets you well for the summer as well. You don't have to be um, spending hundreds of million pounds in the summer when you've already got two players that dramatically improve your team anyway. There's a couple of probably gaps and plugs to hold maybe in the summer, but it sets you up really nicely and... Yeah, and it allows them a couple of months to bed in before the start next season as well, obviously, too. Well, uh, save the transfer window chat till next week's episode with the deadline being Sunday or Monday, whenever it is. Um, so I'll go on to the next one. Pat, who's been your player of the season so far? In terms of the entire season, I've just been really impressed with Jacob Ramsey. I think came in, I remember first watching properly in that Newcastle game, the first home game, I think that was. Yeah, I think John's mentioned before, it was like a cauldron and he was a bit nervous to start with, but since that moment, I think it's just been strength to strength for the player, to be honest. I mean, he's got his first goal. I think they're starting to flood in a bit more now. He's got the uh, Norwich one and the uh, United one as well, so he's got a bit of prowess in front of goal. The assists will start coming. I think he's a really key part to how we play, to be honest now. Dragging us forward from the... Um, picking it up on the halfway line, dragging us forward, progressing the team forward and starting to contribute in the final third. So, yeah, especially under Gerrard, I think he's flourishing. 
So I think it's only going to be up from there. It's 20 years of age. It's rare that you see that from a 20-year-old, to be honest, the composure mm-hmm. the, uh, and be able to compete at this level. So yeah, special, special player. But other than that, I'll probably mention Matty Cash as well. You know, when things were pretty low when we were under Dean Smith at the back end of his his reign, and I feel like I can only really remember one player kind of standing up and like putting maybe putting a tackle in, flying in, yeah. giving it the best look. It was always Matty Cash. So I know he hasn't had an assist since December, and his final third productions probably leaves a lot to be desired. But for me, he's always there. He offered, first thing you want your right back to do is to defend. He does that better than anyone else, I think. So yeah, Matty Cash and uh, Ramsey for me. The maturity has shown. I think even last season he showed that he could kind of do the defensive side, go into leads and walls and, you know, keeping tight spaces, doing a really disciplined job under Dean Smith. So then this season playing almost, not like Jack Grealish, but in the way that he can move the ball, I think it's almost weird because we've seen Jack do that and now we've seen Jacob do it. And I don't think that's getting enough praise as well. It should probably get, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's gliding, like, for example, that Norwich goal. We've, we've, we've seen that a lot, but a lot of other clubs wouldn't have even seen that from any of their players before. In, over the last few years, um, and we've just almost replicated that straight away with with a twenty year old coming on, coming into the scene, and you know, I mean, Gerald as a mentor as well, and Gary McAllister, you know, it's it's, it's perfect for him. Um, I think he's been the most consistent player. I think there's been showings from different players. Leon Bailey has shown glimpses. Um, you know, Matt Cash as well, of course. Uh, John McGinn in patches, but I think for the consistency that's shown in what's been a really sort of difficult season in many respects. I think definitely Jacob Ramsey. Ash, are you going to throw me a curveball or are we going to get the hat trick here? No, no hat trick. Um, well, I've seen a comment there, Flash with Buende coming in a bit of form now. But I'm going to say John McGinn, you know, he's already equaled his best ever tally for goals. So he's Premier League three. He's on three already from his, what, is he 18 appearances? And he's coming on strong now. We've seen that first 10 minutes of Goodison, what he can bring. And he's, he must be so annoying to play against, getting his body in and steaming into players. And Villa really miss him when he's not there. We've seen that um, when, he, when he missed the Man U game. Just missed that something in the middle of the park. Brentford as well, I think it was. Um, so really miss him again. And um, yeah, this season, I think he's, he's come on again. I think he's playing his best football under Gerard now. Uh, Gerard, Gerard waxes lyrical about him as well. And in, in, in the press conferences, quite, quite often we were asking about Gerard. What do you think of McGinn's performances, this, that and the other? Obviously, he's been linked with a move to Man U in the summer. Well, yeah, I think McGinn, McGinn's coming on really strong now. I was, I was impressed with him in the Euros back in the summer. Mm. But this season, I think he's starting to get uh, up and up, up level. So um, hopefully he adds to his goal, goal count as well. He's on three already. But yeah, I'll, I'll say McGinn for me. I think Villa miss him, miss him dearly when he's not there. I just want a name from each of you here for a moment and then I'll decide whether who, you know, if somebody's worth talking about. Um, when Joe first came, we, we talked a lot about who might benefit the most and, and suffer the most from his appointment. So, first of all, who's benefited the most as a, as a player from Joe's appointment? I just wanted a rapid, quick fire name from each of you first. Buendia for me. I always thought the uh, system was going to work for him. So, yeah, Buendia. Buendia, yeah, got me. Yeah, hat trick Buendia for me as well. <laughs> okay, lovely stuff. Who wants to talk about Buendia and why he's improved? Who wants to take that? It was always going to be difficult for Buendia at the start, wasn't it? No one really knew where he was going to play or if it was a cam or if it was a right winger. And then Gerard kind of splits you down the middle and goes, okay, I'll just put him as an inside forward. <laughs> both. both of them. <laughs> and then, it, shockingly, that works for him. So, yeah, it's worked really well. I think he's only going to get better with Coutinho. Once Coutinho beds into the team, they build a bit more of a connection up. And if it with Watkins uh, hits a bit of form or Ings comes into the side, for, beats him to it. And the players around him are only going to make him better. So, yeah, the connection with Coutinho is the two number 10s, getting a striker ahead of him, the scoring. And Villa winning games are all going to benefit. I think Bundy is going to be a key part to it. Flip side of that then, who's suffered the most? It's time format. Just give me a name first and then we'll decide what to do afterwards. It's got to be Target, hasn't it? Mm. Tar- target. Yeah, <laughs> Target. <laughs> Go on then, who wants to talk about it? No, it's the obvious, isn't it? I mean, I think in the first couple of weeks of the press conference, Gerald said he wanted competition, better competition at fullback and cash in the target must have been looking around each other in the dressing room thinking we're going to up it here and yet um, Dean's availability Luca Dean's availability Villa swoop team 25 million pounds deal done target sit on the bench now for me uh, Lucas the man for me so yeah I think even before that I think target suffered a bit of form he was player's player last season don't forget um, I think playing beyond closed doors probably helps a target for me um, he can contract his game a bit more and, and yeah he might get a bit flustered when there's a crowd on the touchline against him. So I think, look, yeah, Matt Target has suffered for Gerald coming in. I think Gerald wants better quality there in terms of going forward as well. We've seen the cross at the weekend. 
with Wendy's header as well. So Luca Dean's added added much more quality. And I think targets. I well, we asked we asked Jared about target last week. How did he take the news? He said he's done really well. He's he's up to his training levels now, and he's fighting Luca Dean for, for a starting shirt now. So that 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 can only be a healthy for Villa. So yeah, um, Luca Dean signing the manner of it as well. And first game in targets dropped. I think targets the only right, right answer there to as the player who suffered most at the moment. But the lads think of a. Another another name there. Who else well, suffered, do you reckon? My, my next question was which players disappointed you the most this season. So it might not necessarily be that he's he's suffered just because um, he's been replacing mm. the team. But in terms of a performance, maybe you're expecting a better player. But I wrote this name down with Leon Bailey in mind. Sign him. Yeah. Thinking, yeah, he's he's part of that Jack Grealish replacement. Exciting player mm. from Germany. And feels like he's kicked a ball twice and got injured mm. doing it. Danny Ings or we look at the first half of the season. When there, mm. totally yeah. different player now. So, oh, yeah, was. So Sanson, I feel like yeah. a real player in there. And just, I can't see it consistently enough. He gets on, has a good game against Chelsea, and then costs us a goal against United. And I feel like everyone's starting to write him off again now. And everyone's just uh, looking at a new sentiment that we're going to sign. But yeah, I think there's a real player there. But I just want to see the consistency of him. And I think it's going to be difficult for him to get back in the side now, to be honest. Why Ings, Ash? It's just not working, is it? Square peg round. I'll keep calling it. I was at the 23s match the other night, and we was on about it because you had, you had Brad Young and Louis Barry linking up, and someone next to me went, See, they're, they're, they're two strikers you can work together. <laughs> not, not seeing that in the first team, are we? So, a few laps in the, in the stand, quite funny. Um, but she's not working, is it really? I mean, was that signing to appease the dressing room and to appease fans, knowing it came in the same way Grealish went? I think if you look at, I think it lifted the dressing room off, off the back of the Grealish sale. We're getting a, Danny Ings in, oh my God, what, what a player. Always bangers against us. Quality player, uh, real marksman in the Premier League. Record's good. We'll get him in for thirty million. That should do it. He should get the goals. But you forget him. We got Ollie Watkins at the club. who's used to playing uh, central striker on his on his own, and um, he suffered a little bit at Watkins. So both of the goals records aren't great either. I think I did a bit of digging yesterday. Watkins is scoring every three hundred odd minutes. Danny Ings is just two hundred eighty odd minutes every goal. So it's not good really. So Danny Ings, yeah, is it working? I don't don't know. There's a player there. Look at his finish in Brentford. Watkins doesn't finish that. Not many, not many in the league finish that on his weaker foot. So there's a player there, like, like we've seen, but just get get fitting him in. I'm, I wonder if wonder if things will be looked at in the summer. Try and try and cash in a little bit on him. I'm not sure. But I hope it works out for him because we know what a player he is. But yeah. with the system we're playing, I don't know if it's worth dropping Ings in as, as a number ten as opposed to Watkins and then getting an end of stuff. Pullbacks and whatnot. So, Danny Ings, yeah. How many times you spoke about Ings and Watkins this season, Dan? Just <laughs> we're in January now. We're st- still on about it, but yeah. Danny Ings has disappointed me a little bit given the m- money we paid for him and the way he's not, not fitting into the system. I mean, it kind of sums up Villa season to an extent that we started talking about disappointing players and the, the Facebook comments and us as a. As a- Quartet, is it? <laughs> I was going to say trio, but it isn't. Uh, have come up and, and this was kind of sparked into life and, and th- thought of four or five players that have disappointed us. Carl Wilson says that Ings is useless, and Dave Turner says Watkins' only disappointment is in the goal department. Okay. And he says, Why can't anyone see the problem is Watkins? So it kind of splits opinion whether who's at fault here. Is it Watkins having a run of games and Ings hasn't? So that's not fair on Ings, but then. I don't know. Neither have done great, have they? I don't think that, I don't think any of them come out of this season with with much credit, to be honest. So far, just the flip side of that, I know we've talked about Jacob Ramsey being like who, who's developed better under Gerald than anyone else. Which players maybe surprise you in a good way? Let's have a bit of positivity. Can we list off four or five names now, or is it? Or does that sum up the season that it, it has been more of a disappointment than a positive? McGinn for me. McGinn, I didn't Ramsey, think he was Cash. Type of player. Yeah, I didn't think he was the type of player that you could build the team around. But with each performance, I think you kind of see in that. I just want him tied down to a new contract now to just uh, get rid of this United interest. Hmm. Marvellous in Canberra as well. Obviously. Oh, yes. Yeah. Canberra. Yeah, good shout. Yeah, okay. Well, fair enough. Let's move on. Um, well, stay on the positive side. Highlight of the season so far. Moment of the season's probably, I think it has to be Man United away winning there. We haven't done that at all. Well, we have. Not very, what, once in the Premier League, I think it is, away from home anyway. Hmm. Um yeah, that must be a moment, especially how it happened as well. Obviously, Fernandez plays in the penalty over the bar as well. Uh, as a game, I think that's my moment the season. But in terms of a well, in terms of an actual moment, I'd say Jacob Ramsey's goal at Norwich was special. Um, to be fair, his goal against Leicester as well before it got cancelled out, I thought that was really good. <laughs> that blew the roof off uh, Villa Park, and then his sort of raw emotion as well, and Cash's raw emotion as well when he scored. I think you know, not being in stadiums, that sort of thing, and coming back and mm. seeing 
deliberate like that. That's a bit not refreshing and probably something that we take for granted, I suppose. Um, and then just as a side one as well, I think Coutinho signing as well is just quite mental. Like we'll probably look at, look back at that in a couple of years and think, well, maybe not look back, but certainly if you told us that a couple of years ago, um, you know, that's it's quite crazy when you think about it. So, um, yeah, those are my moments. But as I said, definitely Man United away. Um, we can't forget how good that was. And that was Dean Smith's last one as well. So it has a bit of meaning. I, I like the Leon Bailey goal against Everton. You come on, mm. a lot of hype around the signing. And the way he just, just volleyed, nearly took the roof off the, of the net and he broke the net and he injured himself in the process as well. But yeah, that moment there going through me up against Everton. It was a Friday night game as well, was it? I think um, so, yeah. Evening game. I think the roof came off the place then. That was, that was a nice moment that was. And, but yeah, like you say, the man knew away we was special but um yeah Ramsey good goal against um Norwich as well and Jed Gerrard's first game was was a big moment as well mm. that late wind didn't play well a lot of, lot of trepidation in the air that day Brighton on top and then just get that win in Gerrard's first game in charge it was pretty massive but yeah moments I like, I like Leon Bailey's volley I really did and shame he got injured I've just said my one mine was the uh, Brighton game you know, it was tense. First 15 minutes, I thought, oh my God, he's, he's transformed the team. We were pressing all over the shop. Yeah. We had a chance, I think, a McGinn header or something, or a cash cross or something like that. And then it was a really tense game. I feel like the atmosphere went a bit flat and everyone was getting a bit uptight. And just to see uh, Watkins wrap that one into the back of the net and then the celebrations from Gerard, it was just relief from everyone. And it, yeah, I love that moment. That's the moment for me. I don't want to stay on this one for too long. I've got a low point of the season. I only want to come to you, Ash, because you, obviously you've been there home and away every single game. So there's a moment when you kind of sat there up in the press box on a drive home or something and thought, oh, bloody hell, that was rubbish. Southampton, yeah. I thought, yeah, yeah. thought so. Southampton, yeah, it didn't look good, did it? Um, yeah, did a Q&A in the morning. I thought, he might, he might, he might survive. He'll have one more game. Only go out in his shield. I kept saying that, didn't I? From the vibes I was getting from those within Villa, but they axed him straight away. No messing. Well, I get Gerard in straight away. But yeah, Southampton, that Friday night, that big game, coming into that game, full defeats on the spin. Come on then, let's get a result here. Let's kick things into into gear. Even if it was a one 0 I think I spoke to you. Even if it's just a scrappy one 0 we'll take it. Mm. Um, and then go into the international break. Then we have got Brighton and Palace coming up. You know we can t- start to turn it around and Dean can start to turn turn it around. But what we've seen St Mary's that night, nothing. Um, I was a stats of that night. Uh, three shots on target. We didn't didn't allow a glove on them to be honest. And Wright was on the wall after that. So Southampton away that evening. Yeah, not very good. We're 11th in the table, as things stand, 26 points. Uh, for reference, Arsenal and Spurs are in 6th and 7th with 36 points, so 10 behind. Uh, I don't know what the games are. I should have written that down as well, Sean, to be honest, and I've done this research. Uh, looking the other way, Newcastle are in 18th with 15 points, or 11 ahead away from that. So realistically, what else can Villa achieve this season? There's no silverware to play for, of course, apart from the, the league title, which would probably be a bit beyond us. So how far up that, t- up that table can they climb? I have written the next five fixtures down. Leeds, Newcastle, Watford, Brighton and Southampton. And I'm going to go into every one of those games thinking we can get a win, to be honest. So, you know what, you get 10 points from there, it kicks out the second half of your season, and who knows where you are. I'm still hopeful that we can get in that eighth range, eighth, seventh. Mm. Compete with the likes of Wolves. Yeah, I think maybe a Conference League or something still on the cards. Maybe top six is a bit of a stretch, but yeah, top eight. Yeah, I agree. I think that's probably our ceiling, to be fair. Um, if you look at the teams above us, Wolves, uh, Brighton, Leicester, we've beaten Leicester and Brighton both at home. And obviously we've lost to Wolves, where we've shown that we can be winning 2-0 until the 80th <laughs> minute. Um, well, we, can, we can go head-to-head against any team in the division, in my opinion. Uh, but it's just that consistency again. Like you look at Brentford away, we lose two one. That's a very poor result. But then you back up and you win out Everton, uh, and Everton have uh, just sat the manager and should have got a bounce from that. But we nullified it. Mm-hmm. And as far as the next five games, really important. Uh, so I'd have thought a top half of the table finish. Uh, can we finish above those little that little sort of league above us sort of thing? Um, whenever you ask Gerard about European aspirations, is always quick to sort of kill it off. But then a couple of players also come out like when they said a couple of weeks ago saying that we want to finish in those European positions. I don't know if that's just them saying it because, of course, yeah, you want to do finish in those positions or if it's an actual ambitious target. Um, it's very boring, but it's just game by game, isn't it? But if you're saying game by game in the next five games, then you're looking at you know a very nice points return. So it's certainly positive. Looking up rather than down, uh, we've got Leeds and Brighton to play both twice as well. Don't forget, postponed yeah. games there. So there's points on the board there. Then two sides are both struggling. So um, that's quite nice to be set up, but yeah, I think I think like John said I think eighth 
could be the ceiling for us, given given the difference, ten point difference between Arsenal and Spurs. Two teams you've got to play as well. But yeah, all to play for. I think Gerard, it's a ma- massive, um, massive little little month to come now, February and March. Gerard banged on about that to me. He said it's huge now. We're going to get we're, we're gonna have a real good go at it. Um, so the, the players are in tune. The players are focused on that. And yeah, I think you've got to look, got to, look to lead, probably look to Leicester, Brighton, and if you can, Wolves and push Tottenham and Arsenal close. And and yeah, just try, try and try and get, get some momentum, get a couple of wins on the bounce, and you never know where, where you end up. So plenty of points to play for. And um, top eight, why not? We've played Brighton, says Dave. Did you mean Burnley? Ashley said we've got to play them twice. Yes, Burnley. Burnley, Sorry. yeah, I thought so. Um, let's have a little bit of a transfer round up then. There were some questions at the start, if I can find them. Updates on a centre-back. I'll, I'll come to you for these, Ash, I think. Centre-back doesn't sound likely, does it, I don't think? Yeah, no new names coming to the fore, really. Joe Gomez, that deal was on, off and on again. Um, he's disappointed with his lack of match minutes at Liverpool. So, again, I can't see club selling, to be honest, yeah, from the noises I'm getting. Yeah, no, no real new names, really. I asked Gerard about this last week, centre-back search, what's going on. He said we might need to pounce on, on one that comes available later on in the window. So five days left to run. Nat Phillips, James Tarkovsky have been mentioned, but nothing concrete in them. So it could be a, could be a little curveball coming in. You're looking at a right-sided centre-back to come in. I think Kant's, Kant's got like his shirt. You ain't going to dislodge him out of the team. So he's got to be one to come in who's prepared to sit on the bench for the first few weeks and hopefully get the nod. So so I think deadline day, hold on to your hats. The, the lights could be on at Body Moore Reef. So we'll see. So the one that people are going to be asking about is... is- Bentancor or, or Bentacor, I don't know what the pronunciation is. Uh, Path, believe you've done a, a profile on this. I think you have. Yeah. You're nodding. All right, talk to us about him. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not the uh, CDM that I think everyone was hoping for, like the Basumas of the world. But he's a player that's got an immense amount of quality. He's got he fits into the Gerrard uh, profile of a midfielder. You know, immense work rate, passing ability, good on the ball, can progress the team forward, or it's passing or just dragging us forward himself. But yeah, I think. It, to me, it kind of hints that Louise is off. You've got all this noise around him and Arsenal and Newcastle at the moment. And Benson Kaur's like best position this season. I think Allegri just doesn't fancy him as that number six. He can play there, but he doesn't fancy him for Juventus there. So they've played him in like a midfield two, in a 4-2-3-1, double pivot, or just like as a box-to-box in general, so like a number eight. So longer and you're probably going to have you save, have the same problems where he can play there. He's probably better at, than Louise at the number six. But it's where, where you want him to thrive, really. You probably want to push him a bit further forward. It's probably hints to me that we're still going to go after a CDM eventually or we're just biding our time until Nakamba comes back. But, yeah, quality player. Everything I've seen so far on the uh, YouTube highlights and the stats, I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah. For 18 million, you know, uh, someone with 90-odd Champions League uh, appearances, 45 international caps already, quality player, quality deal. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on, somebody mentioned earlier on in the comments about what does that, you know, what happens to Douglas Louise if we sign another midfielder. So I want to run through our, well, your three strongest Villa 11s. Now you can include Ben Tanko if you want to. Um, that's that's up to you. But I want you to run through them, compare them, and just see what we, if we can finally almost agree on what our best side is. Mm-hmm. So the formation is a given uh, that 4 3 3 with the narrow number 10s. The back five, I assume, for the whole three of you picks itself with Martinez, Cash, Conce, and Mings, Dean. Take it from midfield, John. You go first, and then we'll go Ash, then Pat, and let's see where we all are. So Benton Core holding, McGinn, and Jacob Ramsey. And then I've got Coutinho left, Watkins, Central, and Wendy on the right. I've just put a piece out on the website now. People have a look at it. I've, 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 I've kept Douglas Louise in there. So I've got McGinn, Ben Tencourt, and Douglas Louise as the eight. And I pushed Jacob Ramsey as the 10. Because I'm unsure on Coutinho yet, but from what I've seen at Goodison, I think it needs a few games to get, get up to speed. So I think we don't know what, what Coutinho is going to come and make an impact. But like the lads are mentioning in, in the piece, a full of, uh, fully fit and firing Coutinho. First name on the team sheet, that's a given. I'm reserving judgment on Coutinho at the moment. Um, just based on what I've seen in that first half, a good ascent, really. A guy that probably didn't suit him in the end, given, given the atmosphere. Duncan Ferguson had him pumped up, getting back against Leeds and, and whatnot. I want to see the best of him. So, but yeah, I've got Jacob Ramsey as a 10. I think him and Wendy could work well with the Watkins up front. And like I said, you know, I think I'm agreed to leave someone like Leon Bailey because I think there's, there's much more to come from Bailey. I know he's had his injury troubles, but the little glimpses I've seen and Conversation about people close to Gerard. He's the one that's really impressed him at training prior to his injury. So, yeah, but yeah, like you say, McGinn, Benton Court, keeping faith with Douglas because I like him, Ramsey, Buendia, and Watkins for me. Same as John, but like I said, I, I think it'd be quite exciting to see Ramsey pushed for, further forward and see what I can yeah. do in the final third a bit more. So, yeah, I'm fine with either of those. If Coutinho's not uh, starting, we've got the depth. 
and you've got the likes of Kai Trickmaker and all them. Exactly. I think he's leading yeah. in terms of shot creating actions or or expected assists per night. Yeah, I saw this morning, I was quite impressed by. So yeah, you throw him into the fold. You've got Bailey to come back, Traore. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So just a little bit further, Ash, for, for Louise and, in, and what happens to him if we do sign a midfield, there's a few people asking about him potentially leaving. He's talking you know, about, yeah. Always linked with the move away, isn't he? At first, it was the the buyback clause from Man City. Now it's Arsenal for twenty five, thirty million. Is is the is today's rumour? It could be somebody else yeah. tomorrow. I don't know about that. I know his contract's running out, and there's talk about whether well, he, he's going to get a new deal and stuff. But there's a, a player there that's worth money. So he's just changed that's, agents. I'm pretty sure as well. Yeah, I just don't see him slipping away to to go out on a free or anything, or go to Arsenal for ten million next season or whatever. It just that, that doesn't seem the Villa way at the moment. I feel like it would be smarter than that. He's an enigma, isn't he? I'm getting my word out. Mm. He's a, he real divides opinion, like they say. He floats through games. He's got clearly clearly got ability, you know. He's, he's only 23, been around the block. Right, Vasco, Man City and um, Brazil. I don't know if he's... Is he serious enough, do you know what I mean, to kick on? I think he just he's coached through games. He finds it a bit easy. Mm. I think Gerard wants a bit more from him. He wants him to boss games now and really take it to the opposition where I think he just... Plays it nicely, good on the ball, isn't it? Good in possession, but uh, I think Jared wants wants that little bit more to, to force the issue, as opposed to wait, wait for an issue to, to come. So, yeah, really, really interesting one. It's going to run along. Seventeen months left on his contract. Twenty three years old. I think Jared wants a big squad next season. To, 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 he said that last week. So I think having Douglas around, that's no brainer for me. But like you say, if there's a chance to cash in, there's going to be suitors there from Italy and. Arsenal are keen. 15 million villa bought in for you. You know, take a little bit of profit on that. I'm sure you will. So, mm. yeah, it's going to, I think we'll, we'll, we'll find out for sure uh, this summer. If you, I can't see him going in this window anyway. No, so, I can't. Uh, this summer will be the one. 12 months left in his deal then. We'll find out if they want to keep him or whether they cash him. What do you like to think of him, Pat, John? I think, to be honest, I think whatever decision's made now, I think you say, Ash, I think it's, it's, it's almost like a business decision now, isn't it? Because he hasn't yeah. signed, I don't know if he's been offered a contract, but it, that contract, the one that was where he hasn't signed a new contract since he joined the club and he doesn't come across as a player that's going to stick around for another couple of years. I'm not too sure because he's already been here for how many years now? Uh, approaching three, three, four years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. Uh, one thing's certain is like if, if he's getting linked to an Arsenal, he's getting linked to a Roma, he's, we know he's a quality player. So I think, you know, comments saying that he's either not good enough to play in the team or we, or we need to cash in for X, Y, and Z. Really. I disagree. I think he's a very good player and he can certainly offer plenty to the squad. And Gerard knows he can. I'm just say, Ash, I think I, I agree in terms of he does look a bit like he's not coasting, but he can do so much more. You yeah. know, you hard to be break the sprint sometimes and use his sort of physicality like he probably can. Um, so, I mean, we'll see. I think it's probably too late in the window now that we'd sanctioned the deal. Um, yeah. But I don't know, in maybe the summer. Um We'll see where that lies, where the ground lies there. But if you can, if you can get Benton Core, then you've got the camera as well. They're, those are two two players you can use as a six at least. And obviously, we're interested in Basuma too. So there's no smoke without fire, and it just doesn't seem like he's going to be sticking around for many more years. And again, I don't think we're going to be letting him on, let him leave on a free either. So um, mm. but it's again, it's going to divide opinion from now until the summer, I'm sure. Yeah, Joe, I could have said last week. He said I want him to stay. Didn't. So interesting. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, Morgan Santon, Douglas Ruiz, two similar players there. What's the future hold for them? It's, they've got it all to prove, haven't they, from now until May? Do they want to stick around and be a part of this, this new era? So hmm. they've, they've got to kick on as well. Gerard said as well, didn't he? He, want, he doesn't want to block pathways, which I, th- I always think is really interesting because you look at Kani Chukamaka, he's clearly singling, singling him out and obviously Jack Ramsey. So mm-hmm. We've got a lot of players in those positions. And then if we're looking to bring in another midfielder, slash maybe two, then, you know, it's all proof might be put in, but it's not necessarily the right signals, I suppose, in terms of always sticking around for much longer. If you were in charge of Villa in some aspect, manager, CEO, whatever position, uh, sanctions, new deals, who would be next? Who would be getting a new deal next? Who would you want to be tying down? I'd be trying to tie down Watkins, I think. England international approaching his Really? Prime. That's surprise, isn't it? I think you'll have people in the comments saying, we'll cash in on Watkins. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm such a big Watkins fan. And like, it does it, I don't get annoyed, but like, I, I always do pick... Watkins over Ings, obviously the finishing aspect isn't the same, but I just feel like in terms of what he offers for like the way we play, you know, given that his hold up plays, runs in behind. It wasn't on form against Everton, but I think you should overlook that. Other than that, I thought it's been fantastic. I thought we've looked a lot better side when we're playing just him on his own. You know, final twenty minutes against United, I think he was at top on his own. I think we just play a lot better football and it's Watkins in that four three three. So yeah, 
I'll be trying to tie him down. Interesting is that there's a few you could look at. I mean, Chuck Moika's contract's coming up. But how much do Villa believe in him? Obviously, they're wanting to, they're wanting to sign new terms. He's been looking to do so. Um, my player, I think McGinn's an obvious one, isn't he, really, uh, given the rumours. McGinn's on a... Uh, he signed a 2025 McGinn's contract. So there's plenty of time on that, but... But yeah, um, I'd say McGinn for me. A lot of like Ashley Young for another year, you know, give him behind the scenes. You want to have a look at it another way. But, but yeah, McGinn, I'd tie him down for a, a longer contract and have him Martinez and build around them guys. No, it's the guys. Watkins, McGinn, they're probably the next ones. Cons to sign a new deal only a, not a few months ago. Sometime last year was it April, I think. Yeah. yeah, so I think we're quite healthy in terms of contract positions. I think you say Chuck Mag's probably the outstanding one and then Ashley Young if you want to do another year. But I thought Jacob Ramsey's probably in line as well. Well, we'll call it a day there. We did a few more questions than I thought we did. Uh, I think we've kind of rattled through most stuff in 45 minutes there to, to assess Villa's midway point pretty much through the, the season under Stephen Gerrard. And Pat, John and Ash, thank you very much for your time as always. We'll have a little break for the podcast now for uh, up until next week when we do something for Deadline Day. So thanks everyone for watching this episode and we'll catch you again on Deadline Day. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa. Up the villa.